During production of The Pebble and the Penguin, Bluth and Goldman met with then-president of 20th Century Fox Television, Peter Schoening, and then-CEO of Fox Filmed Entertainment, Bill Mechanic. The Fox leaders asked to make a new animation division for Fox in Phoenix, Arizona, but Don and Gary didn't want to do it and rather stay in Dublin, Ireland to finish The Pebble and the Penguin. Plus, what they asked for doesn't really make sense. Technically, Media Assets, who owns Don Bluth Entertainment, is owned by Fox, which means that they own Don Bluth Entertainment and thus have an animation division run by Bluth and Goldman. But then, after MGM came in and asked for the giant changes for the Pebble and the Penguin, the two thought, you know what, let's ditch the Penguin and go with the Phoenix. So they head off to Phoenix, Arizona to Fox's new animation studio called... Well, Fox Animation Studios. After The Pebble and the Penguin was released, Don Bluth Entertainment went major downhill and eventually closed its doors. A lot of the animators from the studio moved to Phoenix to stay with Bluth and Goldman, but some decided to let him go and move on to Disney, including Don's good old partner, John Pomeroy. Then here's the bottom line. Our trio's down to two. Oh. Anyways, the first film that they made in Phoenix was Anastasia. Or Anastasia. Whatever, you know how I am with pronouncing names. It's about the tragedy of the Romanovs when Rasputin, who once worked for the Tsar, but then the dude kicked him out and called him a traitor, cast a curse on the imperial family that sparks the Russian Revolution. Only the youngest daughter, Anastasia, escaped the tragedy, but also hit her head and now she has amnesia. A decade later, the Dowager Empress Marie is offering a big reward to find the Grand Duchess. So, two con men called Dmitri and Vladimir found an 18-year-old girl named Anya and plan to give her to Marie as Anastasia. But little do the men know that Anya equals Anastasia. However, Rasputin knows that it's her, and this guy will not rest until every last Romanov family member is dead. Even though the idea of the movie came from the 1956 film of the same name, it's actually loosely based on the urban legend that when the entire Russian imperial family had been executed, the youngest daughter of the family, Anastasia, survived and ran away. But in reality, she didn't really make it at that point in history. And for some reason, these two guys think that it would make a great story for an animated family film. Hey kids, you want to go see a cartoon about the execution of the Romanov family? <laughs> to research the locations of the movie, which are Paris and St. Petersburg, Gary Goldman actually went to the places and took thousands of pictures and even footage of a horse carriage so the animators could analyze and animate them properly. The character Dimitri is based on a European prince who believed that Anna Anderson, who after the execution of the family, she said that she was the Grand Duchess, but then forever known as the Anastasia Impostor, was the real Anastasia. But nobody really cared what he thought because he only met Anastasia once when they were kids. And if you guys want to know which prince was it? Well, I don't really know. From what I could find, he's always referred to as the European Prince. Originally, they were thinking of either Patrick Stewart, Jonathan Price, or Tim Curry to be the voice of Rasputin, but they end up giving the role to Christopher Lloyd. As for the voice of Anastasia, there's actually a few interesting tales about her voice. When they asked Meg Ryan to be the voice, she didn't know if she wanted to do it or not. So Fox gave them an audio clip of her talking in Sleepless in Seattle and made an animated short of that clip. Meg was so impressed of the short that she finally decided to do it. As for Anya's singing voice, while they were doing the temporary tracks, you know, the soundtrack the crew uses to give an example how the song is supposed to be in the movie, the singer somehow didn't come in and at the last second, they brought in Liz Calloway. When the crew heard her singing, however, they loved it so much that it led her to be Anya's singing voice. For this film, Dawn decided to make it in Cinemascope, 
a camera lens that makes the film really widescreen. This is something that's never been done ever since the mid-60s. The composer of the film is David Newman, who also composed many other films like The Brave Little Toaster, Ice Age, and Galaxy Quest. Coincidentally enough, his dad, Alfred Newman, was the composer of the 1956 film of Anastasia. When it was out on November 21st, 1997, get ready to hear something that we've never heard in a long time. It was a success! <laughs> the box office, it managed to get a total of almost $140 million worldwide, making this, as of 2011, the highest grossing Don Blue film ever made. As for the critics, they love the film for its beautiful animation and great voice acting. Now you might be wondering how it went in Anya's home country of Russia. Well, the Russian marketers tried so hard to convince the people that it's a fairy tale film more than a historical film, and it worked. Turned out that the Russians loved it as well. However, not everyone enjoyed the film. Russian Orthodox Christians and historians hated the film for being a happy, inaccurate telling of the Tsar's youngest daughter. Even one historian said that this is like if someone made a film about Anne Frank moving to Orlando to open a crocodile farm with a guy named Mort. Am I the only one who would be interested to watch that? As for Anastasia's actual relatives and the Romanovs, it's more half-half. Some didn't like it and some were cool with it. In terms of awards, there's a lot. The film got nominated for four Golden Satellite Awards, two Golden Globes, eight Annies, and two Oscars. In the end, however, it ended up winning an Annie for Hank Azaria's performance of Bartok and seven other random awards. Two years later, they made a direct-to-video spin-off film called Bartok the Magnificent, which is not only Don and Gary's first direct-to-video film, but also the closest thing they ever made to an actual sequel in terms of movies. Now, there isn't really much to talk about on this film. The only thing I could find about this is that Hank Azaria, Kelsey Grammer, and Andrea Martin were the only people that did a voice in both films. Three years later, they released Titan AE. Set around the same time as every space first-person shooter game, aliens called the Dredge have blown up the Earth. Okay, we're starting good here. They blew it up because they fear of a project that's called Titan. Some humans have escaped on their spaceships, but now they don't have anywhere else to go. Meanwhile, two humans named Croso and Akima are looking for a guy named Kale, who's the son of the project's creator, because he holds the map to find the Titan, which is something that they really need because it can create a new world and unite humanity. Now the three must stop the dredge and find the titan to save the human race. To help make the settings of the film, they took actual pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope of different nebulas and they discovered that there's a lot more colors in space than we thought. To shoot the live action models, they brought in household items and cut them up to look like something from the movie, like a sprinkler would turn into a ray gun, or a vehicle in the movie would be half a jet ski. And it's not like they only shot the front half of it, no. They had to literally cut half of the jet ski. You know, I don't think it's necessary to cut it in half, because they could have probably, oh, I don't know, keep it and actually use it when they're done? Because it's a freaking jet ski? Anyways, the computer animation of the film was done by Blue Sky Studios, who previously did some work in Fight Club, Alien Resurrection, and Star Trek Insurrection. But you may know them more as the animation studio who did the Ice Age franchise, Horton Hears a Who, Robots, and Rio. When they need to animate the spacesuit, they recorded a guy doing the movements while having tape all over him to help the animators get the key marking points on the guy's positions. I would have recommended them using motion capture just to make things easier, but it's their movie. Even though there was a lot of computer animation done, 
the backgrounds were still done by hand. However, when the artists were done, they scanned them on the computer and would add in the lighting to rearrange some colors. In the soundtrack, it consists almost nothing but songs done by different rock bands, mostly ones who do alternative rock. During the time it was out in theaters, they released two novels called Kale Story and Akima Story, which talks about where were these characters during the Earth's destruction by the Dredge, and a Dark Horse comic called Sam Story, which talks about how the guy who invented the Titan tried to hide it. This was the first film to be, and only be, distributed by digital cinema, meaning that the studio sends the film to the internet so the theaters will present them through a digital projector. I said only be because this movie was never turned into film. When it was released on June 16th, 2000, it was... A failure? What? Must be by critics. I mean, it did get mixed reviews by saying that the animation was great, but the story sounds like it took several plot points from other science fiction films. But what about the box office? This is, as of 2011, Don Bluth's most expensive film to make with a budget of $75 million. And I think people would get in there automatically since it's from the makers of Anastasia. Wait, is that worldwide? What the hell happened? I mean, it went so well with Anastasia. Where did things go wrong? Well, there was a theory of its failure because not only of the poor marketing for this film, but also because nobody knew who this film was for. Allow me to explain. When people saw the trailer, they were not sure if it was meant for kids because of the funny alien characters, or if it's for the older sci-fi crowd because of all the space action. When people would then look who made the film, it would only add in to the confusion. On one hand, it was written by the creators of The Tick and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But on the other hand, it's directed by the guys who did Anastasia, An American Tale, and The Land Before Time. But even if it was a failure, it did gain a cult following. A year before it was released, Fox Animation Studios had to lay off 300 of their 380 workers so they could, what they say, make films more efficiently, and not long after the film's release, the studio closed down. During that time, Don and Gary were offered to make another hand-drawn animated film called Ice Age, but because the studio was closing their doors, they both refused and gave the project to Chris Wedge and Carlos Saldana from Blue Sky and turned it into the computer animated film as we know it. Ever since Titan A.E. was released and Fox Animation Studios was done, people have been asking the same question. Whatever happened to Don Bluth? Was he traumatized by the results of Titan and quit the film industry? Did he finally decide to retire? Did he move on to television? Did he have a midlife crisis? Well, not exactly. He still works, it's just not in movies. Bluth and Goldman decided to give out their talented secrets as tutors. In 2004, Dawn released a series of books made for students of animation like The Art of Storyboard and The Art of Animation Drawing. During that same year, they were called by the band Scissor Sisters to do the animation for their music video, Mary. The reason why Don and Gary got the job is because the band had very fond memories of the animated sequence they did in Xanadu. A year later, Don would receive the Windsor McKay Award from the Annies, which is like a Lifetime Achievement Award for his contribution in animation. Going back to the tutorials, in 2009, Don released a website called DonBluthAnimation.com that would feature some video tutorials on animation, DVDs of those videos, which are like 20 bucks each, even live animation seminars. Also on that year, Don and Gary were called to do the storyboard and direct the 30-minute Saudi Arabian animated short, Gift of the Hupo. While they were working on that, they didn't have much say on the animation nor the content which sounds weird since they were the directors, so they asked if they would remove their names from the credits. But those Saudi Arabians thought, well, we would like to get some money from your fans, so let's keep the names in the credits. 
In 2010, both Dawn and Gary got the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Fantasia Film Festival in Montreal, which they even presented Banjo the Woodpile Cat and The Land Before Time, which I actually went to see! I'm dead serious! Not only that I saw these two legends of animation, but I even asked them something that probably every Dawn Blue fan would want to know. Yeah, I'm just wondering, how do you feel about the sequel that you guys have Still not convinced? Check this out! There's me, right there, and there they are signing my DVD cover of The Secret of Nim, which I still have to this day! A DVD box of their best film, signed by both Don Bluth and Gary Goldman? But enough about that. DVD. It's just a DVD. It's just a DVD. We once it. With their new jobs being tutors and stuff, does that mean they won't be making films anymore? Hell no. Apparently, there's a lot of films that they're planning to make, most notably a prequel to Dragon's Lair, and even some computer animated films. As you can see, even the masters of hand-drawn animation can't escape the fact that CGI is dominating today's animation industry. Good thing for Disney giving us a little bit of hope for hand-drawn. Will these films be good? Will they mark the return of Bluth and Goldman? Well, who knows? At this point, I'll let time tell the history of these two legends from now on. My job is to just tell what happened in their past. And now that we reach the present, my job here is done. <laughs>